Let's begin reading at Luke chapter 13, verse 1. I'll read to verse 5, and we'll get into our study. Luke chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. Luke writes, There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Are those 18 on whom the tower in Shalom fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, in the previous verses that we've been looking at, Jesus has been stressing certain things. He's especially been stressing the need for repentance. He also has been stressing the need for conversion. In order to enter into the kingdom of God, in order to be somebody that God is pleased with, you need to repent. And you need to be born again. You need to have a conversion experience. He's been speaking about that. And so what we see is a continuation of the theme that he's already been teaching on when we begin chapter 13, because he continues here to stress the need for repentance and a personal preparation to be with him. Now, as we begin, let me say a couple of things, very basic things here. Notice verse 1. It doesn't really give to us the exact time. It isn't specifically noted, though we we can guess possibly uh, when this may have happened, this thing that he's speaking about, where it says there were present at the season, at that season, some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. We can kind of surmise that this may have taken place during Passover, though it is not specifically stated, and so we have to be careful not to say that that's exactly when it took place. And Josephus, a historian, doesn't register when that happened, doesn't even make mention of that, and no other, no other um, historians during that era speak specifically of this. And so what you have to do is you look at this verse and you say to yourself, well, when could that have been if it's not mentioned in, uh, in detail here? And if secular historians don't give us an exact date, then how can we know or what can we do to kind of figure out when it may have been? And, and the only time that the Jews allowed lay people, non-priests, to, to offer blood sacrifice was Passover. That's the only time. And so, uh, many um, Orthodox commentators believe that you can probably uh, believe that this took place during Passover, but it really doesn't matter. But what is being spoken about here is interesting. I want you to notice that they came to report that Pilate had murdered some Galilean pilgrims. Now, that's not uh, pointing out something that was pretty obvious at that time. It's not that they're pointing out that Pilate is cruel, that he was a political leader that was extremely cruel, because during that day, Pilate was already known to be a very strong and forceful governor. We know that. We know that during that day, everybody knew that uh, the Roman governor was a very powerful man and could be cruel on occasion. Everybody knows that. And so they're not telling Jesus something he doesn't already know. And so when we read this again, we have to ask ourselves, then why would they come and report to Jesus what had taken place? And we know that the reason they do that is because this really has some very deep theological connotations. There's something deep going on here when they bring this up to him. Their reporting to Jesus has a deep theological meaning. You see, at that time, many believed that terrible events like this proved how evil the people were that suffered those events. They believed that if you were, you were an evil person, you would go through evil things. It was very simply that way. That seems to be ingrained in human nature, this idea that the evil people eventually really get penalized and all in this age. And it seems to be just the part of the way that we think. Uh, All the way in the book of Job in in chapter 4, if you take notes, it's found in verses 7 through 9. In Job chapter 4, verses 7 through 9, there's a man by the name of Eliphaz, and uh, he says this. He says, remember now, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his anger they are consumed. Evil people have occurrences occurring to them 
that is from the hand of God. And so the theological meaning here is that they really believe that evil people are treated in evil ways. We see that in the New Testament in other places. For example, in John chapter 9, very interesting passage of Scripture, but in John chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, John records as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Now, you have to picture this. Jesus is walking, and as he's walking by, John, who is writing the gospel, gives us a, an account of what happens. He's walking by, and there's a man who has, is blind, but not simply blind through an accident. He wants us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this man was born blind. He was blind from birth. But notice what Jesus' disciples say. His disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So even Jesus' disciples believe that if something happened to you, it's because you are an evil person. You can even be evil in the womb and be born blind. It's interesting how Jesus responded in chapter 9, verse 3 of John's gospel. Because Jesus answered and said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And so what we're seeing here is the Lord Jesus Christ teaching us something about how God works in people's lives. You see, their personal theological belief was evil people get judged with evil. But at the heart of that would simply be this. They considered themselves better than those who suffered because they hadn't endured those things themselves. Therefore, we are better than the ones who were offering their sacrifices and had their blood mingled with their sacrifice. It may be that they wanted Jesus to preach on how evil those Galileans were in order that they would die like that. But notice what Jesus does here in verse 2. Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans, because, because, were, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? Do you think that? Do you think that they were evil because they suffered in that way? Well, that really goes to the heart of their belief, and it also goes to the heart of our own belief. Here it is. Do you believe that only evil people suffer? Do you think only evil people experience tsunamis? Do you think that only evil people experience fires and avalanches, tornadoes and natural disasters like that? Do you think that it's the evil people and it's evil people who suffer these kinds of things? I have to tell you, over the years, I've heard more than one time somebody who has intimated that they think that those people finally got what they had coming to them. And sometimes people do think that way. There's no doubt about that. They think, oh, yeah, they deserve that because they're evil. Of course, Hollywood guys die of drug overdoses. Look how evil they are. People think that way. They really do. Of course, Brittany goes through all this trouble. Look how crazy she is. You know, she's, people think that way. Even, even Christians, even Christians can say, well, yeah, they're reaping what they sow. Isn't that what God says? Well, Jesus is actually answering a question that has some deep implications here. Do you think that, that good people don't suffer or the bad people always do? Is that what you think? Is that how you think it works in the economy of God? Well, Jesus answers that question. He says in verse 3, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. I tell you, no. Pain and sorrow. Pain and sorrow afflicts all human beings. And it's an equal opportunity experience that all people have. Believers as well as unbelievers can go through some very tough and very difficult times. We know that. This uh, Sunday I was sharing... Some of you were with us on Sunday morning, and I was sharing um, in the book of Acts in chapter 2, and we were looking at prayer, and I was sharing a few things about prayer and all, and after the service was concluded, I went outside, and as I was standing by the gazebo, one of the members of our fellowship approached me, and, and we were having a visit. I've known him for a while now. He's been part of our church for some time. And we were visiting, and as we were speaking, he said, you know, I, I, I needed to hear the Bible study today. The Lord was ministering to my heart, he said. And I said, well, that's great. He said, you know, it's been an interesting, interesting time. Nine months ago, and he begins to share, nine months ago, he goes, my wife's mom, my wife's mom died. And he said, and then about three months or so ago, my sister died. He said, and then... Last Saturday, my mother died. And he said, you know, I began to think, 
In the last nine months, I have attended 27 funerals. I want you to think about that for a minute. In the last nine months, I have attended 27 funerals of friends, and family members, mothers-in-law, my own mother, sisters, people I love with all of my heart. And, and you see, this is a guy who wants to serve the Lord. This is a man who wants to, wants to serve him full time. This is somebody who loves the Lord. Do, do people who love the Lord, do they go through hard times? Absolutely, of course. It's an equal opportunity experience. Everybody does. And to have this attitude that only the real evil go through bad times is something that Jesus had to deal with immediately. I used to wish that I could give invitations where I would say to the church, listen, if you come forward, your life is going to be perfect from the day you get saved. Wouldn't that be a great message? But for me, it, it was perfect for three days. And then after that, man... It can be tough. It can be hard. You go through difficult times. We all know that. It would be great to be able to give a message where, where I could promise you from this day on, everything is going to be absolutely beyond anything, incredibly beyond anything you'll ever ask or think. It'll be so awesome that you will just regret you didn't come to Christ. And, and all of that is true except for one thing. The fact is, is we still go through tough times. You, we, we all know that. Anybody who's around for a while, you know that. If you're a Christian for a while, you know that. You go through hard times just like anybody else. And that's when I started memorizing little sayings, you know, that would speak to my heart. I may not know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. Things like that. Because I, I, I want to keep my eyes on the prize. I want to keep my eyes on the one who's in control because I'm not. And some circumstances, some situations that occur are things that there is no natural answer for. I don't know why somebody's house burnt down. I don't know why that baby has leukemia. I don't know why that newborn baby had to have open heart surgery. I don't know. They just do. Is it because they're evil? Is it because their moms were evil? Is it because their dads were evil? Is it because they were into drugs and that's why? No, that would be ridiculous for me to say, well, you know, they are, they're reaping what they sowed. You know, the bottom line is, is, yes, we do sometimes, of course, we reap what we sow ultimately in, in many senses of the word. But if I sow to the flesh, from the flesh I reap corruption. If I sow to the Spirit, from the Spirit I reap everlasting life. When I got saved, yes, there are things that I used to do that may have ramifications in my saved life now, but God still has a way of restoring me and working through me and, and renewing me and all of that. I'm aware of that. And yes, I could have done some stupid things. And yes, I have to pay for some of the things that I did in the past and all. That's just the way it works. But does it mean that, that I'm going to be exempt from pain if I get saved? And if I'm evil, I'll just be filled with pain? Not necessarily at all. And that's what Jesus is dealing with. So they walk up to him. They say, did you hear about those guys that were making a sacrifice and Pilate killed them as they were making the sacrifice and their blood was mingled with the blood of their offering? And Jesus sees right through that. So what are you saying to me? And you can picture Jesus looking at them eye to eye. What are you saying to me? Are you saying that they were the most evil of all people and that's why? Let me tell you something. And that's how Jesus was speaking to them. Let me say this to you. Unless you repent, you will perish also. What a powerful thing to say. What a powerful thing to say. You need to repent yourself. But he goes on and he says in verse 4, are those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The Pool of Siloam, we read about that in Scripture. When you go to Israel, you have an opportunity to go by it. It's in the southern corner of the city of Jerusalem. It was fed by a small string called the Spring of Gion. Jesus obviously is aware of current events, but he uses this opportunity for a call to personal repentance. When he speaks to them, he's saying, listen, you're talking about those Galileans, northerners, now, there may have been some kind of a prejudice involved in the question even. The Galileans were from the north. They were not respected by the southern Jews, down especially by uh, 
by Jerusalem because the northern portion of Israel was agricultural and the southern portion is cosmopolitan. And so it almost has a similar connotation to how people will look at certain people if they're from a city like New York versus a small country town. So they didn't have respect for them. And so Jesus brings in inhabitants of Jerusalem to balance it out because that's what he's speaking about when he speaks of the Tower of Siloam. And he said, these are men who dwelt in Jerusalem. And so he obviously, being aware of current events, uses that as an example, but he still calls for personal repentance. Now, when he says, and I want you to notice this, unless you repent, the word repent, I want to talk about that for just a moment, because sometimes we hear the word repent and, and we may have a connotation about repentance that is so unbiblical, because sometimes people talk about people repenting and it seems that what they're doing is that they're crying emotionally and perhaps they're doing something with, with great emotion to it. Repentance doesn't carry that connotation, though there may be an element of an emotion involved. You see, my wife Marie, when she first got saved, she really had a problem with the fact that she didn't have the same conversion experience that I had. When I got saved, I went through a big emotional thing. My life was radically transformed, and I was absolutely changed in tremendous ways. But Marie, when Marie was saved, it was kind of like one day she opened her eyes and said, I need Jesus, and she did. there was no emotion, there was no tear, there was nothing. There was just like, I need Jesus. She really had a biblical repentance. She didn't understand it. You see, the word repent, metanoia in the Greek says it speaks of a change of mind. It's a change of thinking. It's a change of thinking how you get to heaven. You see, sometimes people say, I don't think I've repented because I've never cried over my sins. I see some people give their testimony and they weep. I don't do that. Maybe I'm not really a believer. I don't feel those things. My dad was that way. My dad at first thought, I don't know if I'm really a Christian because my son David had this kind of transformation and me, I just agreed. I think that it's right. Well, that's repentance. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of life. It's an agreement with God. It's an awareness that God is right and I'm wrong. And so Jesus says, you need to change your mind. You need to agree with God. Because if you don't, if you don't agree, you will likewise perish. No, you may not have your blood mingled with an offering. No, you might not have a tower fall on you. But you will perish. The word perish speaks of, a, of, of an utter loss. And it speaks really theologically of, of spending eternity separated from God in a place called hell. And that's what Jesus is saying here. If you don't repent is what he's saying. Instead of doing theological nitpicking, thinking of yourself as being better than people who suffer through tragedies, if you don't repent, you will be eternally lost, is what Jesus says. That's why you need to repent. That's why you need to get right with God, he's saying. So it's not an emotional response. It's a change of mind that lasts. It's a, a change of life that occurs because these people agreed with God because they understood the things that God was saying and they said yes. Now, when he says you will perish. We have a promise that we all know in John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so on the one hand, he says, if you don't repent, you will perish. But on the other hand, he says, but if you do, then you have eternal life. And so how can I have eternal life? by repentance, by agreeing with God, receiving the gospel, and saying, God, I need, I need, I need to be changed, not just today, but every day. I, I need forgiveness, not just for today. Thank you that your mercy is renewed every morning. Your compassions fail not, because I need your mercy and compassion tomorrow too, and the next day, and the next day, every day. I need to be washed by you every day. I need to be empowered by you every day. So repentance is a one-time event, but it's also a daily reality where I'm making decisions to follow the Lord and to change. And so Jesus is speaking to them about their suppositions, and he's saying evil people and good people all go through tragedy. The real key is, are you right with God? Now, as he con continues on in verse 6, he also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, 
Look, for three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. So Jesus now gives a parable. Obviously, what we see here is we see an owner of a vineyard coming to seek some fruit from a tree. Now, the problem is, even though it's the season for figs, the tree is not producing any fruit. And so what does he do? Well, he speaks to the keeper of his vineyard, and he says, look it, I've been coming seeking fruit, and it's not producing anything. So he's angry over this. He tells the keeper that over the years he has come seeking fruit, and it is completely barren. So as a result, he plans on tearing it out of the ground. It has had enough time to bear fruit, and I'm tired of it. The question is asked, really, why allow it to take up space and use up resources when it is unfruitful? But notice verse 8. Notice how he answers and says, let it alone this year also. The keeper is asking for more time. Give me another year. I'll give it more personal attention. Give this tree one last chance. Give it added time, and let's see if it'll produce fruit. Now, in order to understand this, we need to develop a context. One, you need to know that the fig tree is one of the oldest trees found in Scripture. As a matter of fact, you first see figs mentioned in the book of Genesis in chapter 3, and you remember how that Adam and Eve covered their nakedness with fig leaves. And so Genesis uh, gives to us a picture that this is a very ancient tree. In the history of Israel, ultimately, a fig tree came to symbolize God's blessing on the nation. Again, when you go to Israel, they will tell you that there are, se there are seven fruits that are representative of the nation of Israel. It's one of the seven fruits of Israel, the fig. In Deuteronomy, in chapter 8, verse 8, God, when he was describing the nation that he was giving to the children of Israel, God said, it is a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. And so it's a picture of God's blessing on Israel. The fig tree eventually became a symbol of peace and security. That's why in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25, during Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel from Dan to Beersheba lived in safety, each man under his own vine and fig tree. And so a fig tree symbolizes the nation of Israel and the blessings of God. The fig tree ultimately came to become a symbol for Israel. And so if you understand that, you're going to understand the parable that Jesus is giving here. So in this particular parable, the fig tree symbolizes national Israel. But national Israel is spiritually dead. It has an appearance of life, but it isn't producing any fruit. Israel had an impressive picture of religion, but it was spiritually dead. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 10 speaks about that. In Romans chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, Paul said, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. The nation of Israel had a very, very outwardly beautiful religious system. And people who went to Israel very often were attracted to the Jewish faith because of the purity, especially pagans. When Romans and Greeks would go into Israel and they would go up into the temple area and the areas that they were allowed to go into, many of them were absolutely awestruck by this because they saw such an outward devotion. They saw such religiosity. They saw such ceremony and all, and, and many of them became God-fearers. They were not fully brought into the promises of Israel through total conversion, but they became God-fearers, meaning that they, they partook in some of the things of Israel because they thought that that nation's religion was so pure and so right and so righteous that they wanted to be part of that. And so on the outward appearance, it was beautiful. They, they, they could come, they could see the temple, they could see so many things, and it was very attractive. 
It's sometimes like people who've got no religious training whatsoever, and sometimes they've gone to Europe and they've, they've toured some of the beautiful cathedrals of, 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 uh, of Europe, and you can walk into some, and I've seen many beautiful cathedrals from various, you know, from Spain to France, you name it. I've been to a lot of countries, and I've seen a lot of cathedrals in Germany, Austria, and you can walk in, and you'll see incredible things. And, you look, and there are people who walk in and they're in awe. They think, look how beautiful these buildings are. But it has an appearance of godliness, but denying the power thereof. It's all just outer appearance. And so that's what happened to the nation of Israel. They had all their outward religion, but no life in it. And that's what Jesus is speaking about when he uses this, this fig tree as an example. Verse 6, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came seeking fruit on it and found none. That's what Jesus is speaking about, the nation of Israel. You see, bearing spiritual fruit will always be evidence of spiritual life. It'll always be that, because that which is alive produces fruit. Oh, I don't know if, you're, if I should tell you this. I've told you this several times over the years, but some of you haven't heard this. And so, for those who've already heard this, Forgive me for using an old illustration, but it comes to mind. For those who've never heard it, we had a house we bought years ago, and the former occupant moved out, but he left a potted plant in the patio. I've never been very good with plants, and uh, I try, but I'm not really very good. But this was ivy. Ivy's pretty hardy. And so I thought, you know, it's cool. He left this ivy here. I'm, I'll take care of it. So I would go out on a weekly basis, and I would water it. Every week I was putting water in this plant, watering it. And I did that for like months. And then it hit me one day, I haven't watered that ivy. So... I opened the slider, and I stepped out. I looked to the left where it was. It was still green, and I thought, oh, man, this is a great plant. I mean, oh, God, you're good to me. You gave me a plant that could withstand my hands. And I walked up to it, and I actually got, I had the hose, and I was walking up to it to water it, and I really did this. I talked to it. I said, man, I said, you're a good plant. I like you. And as I was looking at it, I touched it like it was a little dog. It was plastic. The only thing <laughs> that I had that actually remained green, and it wasn't even alive. Wasn't even alive. And, you know, so I'm glad you laughed. But that's a true story. I mean, it, it had the outer appearance of life, but it was not. No wonder. I mean, it stayed green because it was dyed green. And, and religion can be that. Religion is like that. It has the appearance of life. But when you go to, to, to take some fruit off of it, because it's not alive, there is no fruit. That's what Jesus is talking about here. It may have an impressive appearance of religion, but it is dead. You see, true fellowship with God always produces fruit. And fruit is the result of being engrafted in the true vine, Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, Jesus said, A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's why in John 15, verse 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Of course, empty religion has an appearance of being alive, but upon closer inspection, it does not bear fruit. They may have an appearance of godliness, but no power of godliness. True fellowship with God will always produce fruit. You'll see it in various portions of Scripture. For example, in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verses 22 and 23, uh, you'll have a character that is, is, is fruitful, it's spiritual. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So true fellowship produces character. True fellowship produces conduct. Colossians 1.10 says that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And so, true fellowship with God has a fruit, a fruit of conduct. 
when you're walking with the Lord, there are going to be evidences that you have a relationship with him because it actually produces the fruit of conversions. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15, Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanas, that it is the first fruits of Achaia. They have been addicted to the ministry to the saints. And so part of what is uh, fruitful or demonstrates that you have fruit is that you get concerned with other people, that they get saved too. That's part of the fruit. That's part of concern. One of the ways that I have always, um, by the way, tested my walk with the Lord and I've done this for many years. One of the ways that I've always done it, I was taught to do this and I do it, is um, just checking my heart to see whether I care if people are saved or not. Does it matter? You know, does it matter? That's one of the things that I keep myself pretty aware of. Do I care? Do I care if people get saved or not? Because if I don't, something's wrong in my walk with the Lord. Something's happening in me because I don't care anymore if they're saved or not. And if I don't care anymore, then I'm quenching the Spirit because God cares. And if He doesn't, if He cares and I don't, something's wrong here. And so conversions will always be part of the fruit that God is working into your life. Praise, learning to praise God is part of having fruit. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, by Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. And so, praising the Lord, learning to give thanks to Him, learning to magnify Him, learning to say how worthy He is, that's fruit in your life. Worship is an interesting word. We worship the Lord, but the word worship actually is an old English word, worthyship. Worthyship speaks about the fact that God is worthy of our praise. And one of the words in Scripture, in the original language that is translated worship, actually literally speaks of kissing the face of God. And so when you have a relationship with the Lord, it's a very praise-oriented relationship. It's, it's a relationship where you say, God, you're too much. I love you so much. You, you've worked in my life so wonderfully. And I know all of us who love the Lord experience that. I know we do. There are times that, that I get so overwhelmed that, uh, that I actually become emotional. I mean, just today, my, my grandson Josiah is here and, and, uh, and my granddaughter, um, Sophie. And uh, Josiah was getting on his mom's last nerve. And so she was, uh, Corinne was being a mom, you know, and getting a little uptight. And uh, that's why it's great to have a grandpa around. And so I, I walked and I saw her getting a little uptight. And I said, you know, and I told Josiah and Corinne was holding Sophia. And, and I told Josiah, listen, Josiah. And I said, if, if mama needs to release you for a little while, you can come on into my office and, and hang with me, okay? And he says, okay. I said, now that's if mama is needing to be relieved, okay? Okay. Five minutes later, he says, here I am. So, you know, he, he comes, into my, comes into my office, you know, and, and as he's there, he wants to visit with me, wants me to read to him the three little pigs and this and that, and I was studying, so I said, listen, I said, I'll get to that in a minute, but why don't you just rest for a moment? And he goes, okay, and he sits down, and before you know it, he's laying down, and now he's, I say, you tired, baby? Yeah, so I I wrap him up, and he falls asleep. And there he is laying in my office. I turn all the lights off except for my, uh, my computer. I keep working, walk around there. He's been asleep for a little while. And like so many of you did that with your children, I do that now with my grandson. I sat on the edge of that couch, and I just looked at him. I just looked at him, and I kissed his little head, and I thanked God for my baby. I love him so much. It's easy. It's easy to praise the Lord. Because if it's easy for me to, to, just, to just touch that baby and just, oh, God, I just love him so much. Well, I love the one who gave me that baby. Praise him. It's the fruit of your life. People know that you love the Lord because you have a heart of praise. And then finally, stewardship is also part of the fruit of, of walking with the Lord. Paul in Philippians 4, 17 said, Not because I desire a gift, I desire fruit that may abound to your account. And so when people are saved, there are evidences of that. So Jesus is speaking concerning the nation of Israel. There's just no fruit. So as he's giving this parable here, 
Now, I want you to see this. I want you to see verse 8. In verse 7, it has been said, cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? Why is it using up the resources? It's not valuable. Verse 8, but he answered and said to him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it, fertilize it. If it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. So what is Jesus doing here? Well, he's warning them. He's saying, on the one hand, God is patient and God is merciful towards those who repent. But what he's doing is giving them a chance to repent because he's saying, if you reject that opportunity, you will be severely judged. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, 9. And that's true. God's desire is not that we should perish, but that we should repent. So he gives us time. He gave me 20 years. He gave others, you know, 40 years, 50 years. We've had people in this church get saved in their 80s. What an incredible act of grace and mercy that that person had over 80 years until they came to Christ. And so he's very long-suffering for us because God's desire is that everybody gets saved. Ezekiel 33, 11, uh, God says, Say to them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? God's desire is not that man should perish, but that man should have eternal life. So Jesus in verse 8 and 9 is really picturing himself as the intercessor pleading for mercy for the nation, and that's what he's saying here. But Israel didn't respond to the mercy that they received. In Matthew, in chapter 23, verse 37, we see a beautiful picture, but a very tragic one. And Jesus is there looking at the city of Jerusalem in Matthew 23, 37, and, and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. How often I wanted to save you from destruction. How often I wanted to gather you and protect you because the chicks are out there running around, but the hawk is going to destroy them. I tried to gather you under my arms so that I might lay my life down for you and protect you, and yet you had nothing to do with me, and that's a tragic picture. In Luke 19, 41 through 44, as he drew near, he saw the city wept over it, saying, if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Josephus tells us that in A.D. 70, Titus of Rome, a general, was sieging the city of Jerusalem. People took refuge in the temple. And as they were in the temple, somebody threw in through one of these sl uh, slits there in the wall somebody threw a torch in. And when the torch ignited a, um, some cloth, the entire interior of the temple went up in flames. The heat was so intense that it literally melted the gold and objects of gold that were there in the temple. Now, the objects of gold were immense and of high value, and so, rather than just letting the gold be lost, they came and began to dismantle the rocks that the gold had seeped into. In doing so, they dismantled and destroyed the temple, taking the gold and leaving with it. Jesus' words were 100% accurately fulfilled in the year A.D. 70. And as he was there, weeping over the city, and saying to them, they are going to build an embankment, they are going to surround you, they will close you in on every side, you and your children within you, and they will burn you to the ground. They will not leave one stone left upon another, 
you did not know the day of your visitation that was literally fulfilled in A.D. 70 when Titus of Rome destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Repent, is what Jesus said, because if you don't, you will all likewise perish. But we have repented. We don't perish. We have everlasting life in him. But his word is true. To those who repent, you have life. But to those who do not, then God's judgment awaits you. It's a choice that we made, and we made the right one when we gave ourselves to Jesus.